something beside me A light to the kerosene And the places aren't real anymore And the faces don't say anything From Devil's Chess Club. I'm Aaron Good. Today, my guest is former CIA officer and CIA torture whistleblower John Karyaku. We're going to be discussing Russia, the Ukraine war, the Moscow terror attack, the Gaza genocide, and the Zionists' recent deadly attacks on Iran's embassy in Syria and on American aid workers. And we're going to tie all this into bigger historical issues that the establishment would prefer us to forget the CIA's covert operations, and the ways the agency advanced U.S. imperialism by collaborating with drug traffickers, jihadi terror networks, oil companies, and the intelligence services of U.S. client states. Please check the show notes for a link to Loud and Clear, John Kiriakou's Substack page. This episode of Devil's Chess Club is available to everyone courtesy of Four Died Trying, the new documentary film series which explores the extraordinary lives and cataclysmic assassinations of JFK, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Robert F. Kennedy. There is now a Patreon page for Four Died Trying. It offers patrons a number of other perks, including a new Four Died Trying podcast and access to the newest film, Chapter One, The World As It Was, which is also coming soon to other major streaming platforms. John Kariaku, great to have you back. Thanks for having me. Happy to do it. So you are a former CIA officer, and your some of your expertise was in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. And I think that makes you well suited to comment on some of these things that I, that we've been working on on the, on the American Exception podcast and here on uh, that we've been discussing it on Devil's Chess Club. Also, I want to first see what you think about some of the recent events with uh, going on with Israel and this Gaza. Gaza, I don't want to call it a war, this massive slaughter, genocide, yeah. Yeah. whatever we want to call it. And one of these comes from Moon of Alabama, a post uh, that came out today. We're recording this on April 8th. And they say two Israeli actions misfired, pushed Netanyahu into retreat. And you know, he, he's a wise guy misspelling Netanyahu's name that way, but I'll <laughs> forgive him for that. Um, he says there's serious signs that the Israeli government under pressure from the U.S. is moving towards an intermediate ceasefire state that all sides may be able to live with for a while at least. This has split the Netanyahu government and may well in the coalition which supports it, which I think is quite plausible considering the war seems to be the only thing keeping him afloat. Uh, after six months operations in Gaza, uh, Israeli government has achieved none of its objectives. Hamas isn't defeated. The hostages haven't been released. There's no plan for who's going to rule Gaza in the future. So it's been kind of a disaster. What do, what is your take on the on this on what what this guy's saying that, that these blunders yeah. recently? The two big ones he's talking about, which I didn't put in this, but it's we're talking about the killing of those aid workers and then the attack on the Iranian embassy, which is not just a violation of the, you know, Geneva or the Vienna conventions, but it's, it's, it's worse than that. What do you, because I think it's a, it's a provocation, which is without a bigger war. Yes. And that's, that's the only motive that makes any sense. And so what do you, what do you make of of this? Do you think that this is really going to be something that sticks because just the logic of it, it makes no sense for really Israel or the U.S. to keep persisting in this way? Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, first of all, he, he's right that there are real signs that the Israeli government may not survive this. Benny Gantz, the former defense minister, who's now a member of the Israeli war cabinet, was in Washington a week ago, two weeks ago. And um, he reportedly told Um, senior American officials, including uh, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Secretary of State Tony Blinken, as well as the the National Security Advisor, that he was ready to 
pull out of the war cabinet and he was ready to withdraw his party, uh, the blue and white party from the emergency coalition. That in and of itself would be enough to crash the government. Now, one of the reasons why Netanyahu does not want that to happen, besides the obvious that he wants at least some semblance of national unity in order to continue fighting this thing, um, is that if Netanyahu is no longer prime minister, he is again liable for prosecution on multiple uh, felony corruption indictments. And, and he's not the only one who's been indicted. His wife has been indicted for corruption as well. So he has his own selfish reasons for wanting to keep this war going as long as possible because it protects him politically. Um, to the second point, uh, I think that this, uh, that this attack on Gaza and the wholesale slaughter of civilians, which really is what we're seeing, was a catastrophic mistake for Netanyahu for a couple of reasons. Number one, and and Moon of, or Moon of Alabama says it right here, there's no viable plan who, if not Hamas, will in future rule the Gaza Strip. That is absolutely correct. Joe Biden made a, made a, a stupid statement several weeks ago saying that U.S. policy is that the Palestinian Authority would um, run the Gaza Strip. That is a non-starter from before you can get the rest of the sentence out of your mouth. In Gaza, they hate the Palestinian Authority. It's corrupt, it's weak, it's ineffective, and it's wholly in the pocket of the Israeli government. Besides that, Mahmoud Abbas is something like 18 years into a four-year term, and so nobody wants him. Nobody, literally nobody wants it. Um, if anything, it's Hamas that would be elected to lead the West Bank. You mean right? if it was democratic? If there was a democratic election to be held in, in Palestine. So that's just a non-starter. Uh, now, getting to the point about the, uh, the bombing of the Israeli consulate in Damascus, I think that the Israelis gave that a lot of forethought. I think that the only way the Israelis see themselves winning this thing is in something like a Samson scenario where, you know, going house to house and mowing down Palestinians and bulldozing their homes and flattening Gaza, that's, that's not really going to win it, win it for them. They still have the West Bank to worry about. And Palestinians are united, of course. And so I think that the Israelis think that if they can draw in the Iranians and Hezbollah, maybe the Syrians too, it would give them reason to perhaps use nuclear weapons or to raise the stakes in this conflict to a point that we've never even considered before. Crazy dangerous, not just for the region, but for the whole world. But I think that that's what the Israeli calculus is. You know, look at what the Israelis are doing, too. There's no turning back from what they've already done. It's not just about ground troops and hostages. It's about, for example, you and I are talking on Monday, the 8th of April. Uh, on Saturday, the 6th of April, CNN reported that Israeli doctors told Haaretz, the big Israeli newspaper, that they are now doing an inordinate number of amputations because Palestinian prisoners are being cuffed for as long as six months. Can you imagine? You've been handcuffed since October, and now you have to have your hands removed? There was another report, again, from Israeli doctors to Haaretz that Palestinian prisoners are being brought into the hospital they're being asked which limb they prefer to keep. And then the other one is crushed in a vice and then amputated. Okay, that's, that's clearly, obviously, a crime against humanity. You can't do things like that. It's illegal. It's barbaric. And they're doing it anyway. And this isn't, you know, some Palestinian blogger who's saying this. This is Israeli doctors telling Haaretz 
Well, I think that this is just the beginning of what the Israelis intend to do to the Palestinians. I think we haven't seen the 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 ultimate in Israeli uh, barbarism against prisoners. I was speaking with a with an Israeli activist, an Israeli human rights activist, a week ago, and he said that a Palestinian uh, colleague of his was just released from prison, an Israeli prison, and he said that since October the seventh, Israeli I'm sorry, uh, Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons have not been permitted to walk, if you can imagine. They're only permitted to crawl on their hands and knees. And he said that they've gotten to the point, many of them, where they envy the Gaza Palestinians because they're dying and that death is preferable to what's happening inside Israel's prisons. There's just no excuse for what's happening. Yeah. I mean, I, it, to my mind, the only thing you can compare it to with a mechanized modern industrial nation state carrying out this kind of, you know, primitive slaughter is uh, Nazi Germany. I mean, it's a, yeah, Le Lebensraum and greater Israel obsession, the master race, yeah. chosen people. It's so right in your face. And the, it's the Israel lobby, their flax are always there to like say, oh, that's the most offensive thing you could ever right. say, blah, blah, blah. And well, at this point, the man, fits. what are they going to say after the fact? Because think about some of the things that these ridiculous flax, like the ADL, like remember when they went after uh, Ilhan Omar for saying it's all about the Benjamins and they tried to say like, right. oh, that's an anti-Semitic trope because right. you're saying – that the lobby, you know, pays all this money to people, which they obviously do, but that's like the stereotype that like Jewish people have all this money and they're controlling things. So naughty, naughty, but like obviously lobbying works and it's about money. So it was a ridiculous thing to begin with. But after this genocide, the little things that they accuse people of, it's going to be funny because all of these people that are flax for the Israel lobby are all guilty of, they're guilty of crimes against humanity for advocating for genocide mm -hmm. and supporting this. Yeah. So they're they're essentially like people who are mass murderers or guilty of horrible crimes against humanity just for flacking for this genocide. And they're going to talk about these little infractions of people who like maybe made some comment that could be interpreted as this or that. I mean, it's a joke. I don't know what they think they're going to do after this. The ADL is going to be a total laughing stock after this. Any serious person will hear all of their pronouncements and laugh at these people. Yeah who are basically genocidal monsters and they're somehow out there policing the language and scolding people for the things they do wrong. Like you're, you're backing a genocide and terrible crimes against humanity. And you have a job to like go around and tattle on everyone. It's yeah, just a right. joke. What do they think is going to happen in the, after this? Like, and, and, and you realize they didn't think it through because they're no, insane. They they're didn't. just insane. There's no, I don't know any other way to say it. I don't have any sympathy for any Americans who are like, oh, I still like it because I don't know. I was brainwashed for my whole life to like worship this flag in the yeah. state. I mean, when you worship a state like a, a, and you think it's this magical thing, that's fascist. That's a big part of fascism. I mean, that's essentially a fascist idea. The like organic state, the metaphysical state. So I just, I don't see how it's, I think Israel may be done because it's going to be so ghastly going forward. I mean, the younger generation, and it's just going to get worse because you recall the yes. Nuremberg trials, you know, you had a while at the Nuremberg trials where Goering was like kind of being a bit of a raconteur and the proceedings seemed to be going not as badly as you would have guessed. And then they showed this film that was made, this documentary. Well, there's going to be a documentary made about this when the dust settles. And it's going to, because of t advances in technology, there's going to be so much more material. I hope Abby Martin, she should oh, yeah. she should be the one to make it because she did the Gaza Fights for Freedom I thing, agree which with is a you. great thing to show anyone who says they should use nonviolent resistance. Well, we see what they do. You get shot in the leg by Israeli snipers. Yeah, that's so right. So they need to document this, and we need to have a, a, a full accounting in some way of this, at least the leadership has to be, I mean, these BB should be and spend the rest of his life in jail, but you know, how do we how get to that point? How in the world he's been successful over the years here in the United States in convincing people, not just people, people and institutions that any criticism of him personally is anti-Semitism is a mystery to me, but maybe this conflict has been so brutal that it will serve as a wake-up call for Americans to realize that 
that there is no excuse at all under any circumstances to treat human beings the way the Netanyahu government is treating Palestinians. You know, I went to Israel. It's, it's funny. I've been to, I've been to literally every Arab country except Libya, everyone in the world. Um, I had never been to Israel until two years ago. It was the first time I'd gone. And you know, you, you go to Tel Aviv, you're sitting in the center of Tel Aviv at a cafe and you look around and you say, my God, this place is fantastic. It's first world, palm trees, beautiful beaches. And then you go to Palestine and you say, my God, this is the world's largest outdoor prison. How can these poor people survive in these oppressive, violent, hopeless conditions? And yet they do. And I'll tell you, one of the things that we should be thinking about and maybe even worrying about is this statement that was made by, by Jared Kushner a couple of weeks ago about how much you would like to develop Gaza as a resort, beautiful beachfront property. This is extremely dangerous, and it, did, it didn't just pop off the top of his head. I think this is what the plan is. About oh, it's, four, crimin it's criminal in and of itself. It's, it it's is. more evidence of genocidal intent. Yeah, exactly. And about four weeks ago, Itamar Ben-Gavir, the minister of whatever, uh, national security, I guess it is, um, uh, sponsored legislation in the Israeli Knesset to provide exit visas for any Palestinian that wants to leave. Well, the, the, the policy, the Israeli policy since 1967 is that Palestinians can't leave. I was talking to a Palestinian physician just a couple of months ago, and he said that uh, he was born and raised in Gaza. His parents always stressed education. And so he studied and studied and studied as hard as he could. And he actually got a scholarship to attend a French medical school. And so he applied for an exit visa and was denied. And he reapplied every single year for seven years. And then for reasons that he's never understood, they approved him. Now, the, this French school was good enough to, to renew the scholarship every year for seven years. So he went to France got a medical degree, and the Israelis never let him back in again. What he wanted to do was go back to Gaza and to be a physician there to treat his people. The Israelis never let him back in. So now it's the opposite that the policy is. The policy is to get everybody out, send them anywhere they want to go, just get them out, send them to Jordan or Egypt or the United States or wherever so that the Israelis can settle that land Right, they'll take it over and turn it over to to uh, settlers, mostly American settlers, and the Jared Kushners and Donald Trumps of the world can build resorts in violation of international law on Palestinian territory. I really believe that that's the policy. It was not an accident that he just that he just came out with it. Right, and I don't. I mean, I, it will be interesting to see if they can pull that off. I don't see how you'd be able to do that in, uh, with the rest of the world and with the, no I think way. the ICJ, the ICJ originally handed down an indictment. I mean, that was essentially what the earlier ruling was and they were, they will investigate and revisit this. And it's going to, unless that body is so corrupt that, uh, that it's hopeless yeah. Then they're going to come back with a. I mean, it's so straightforward. The. I mean, I, I can't think of another case like this because there hasn't been any group that's been as hubristic as uh, the Israelis about it. And when you yeah. look back at it, this all it, it's it's a straight line from the '90s. I mean, Netanyahu was the guy who commissioned the clean break report with people like Wolfowitz and Richard uh, Richard Pearl. Richard Pearl. And this was on the heels of the '92 or 91 insano Paul Wolfowitz Pentagon defense strategy uh, yeah. paper that was leaked because H.W. Bush was not as insane as these guys. Uh, and they leaked it. And I think that the neocons got their wings clipped. And that's probably why that could be largely why H.W. Bush lost in 92. Mm -hmm. But then a few years later, they're issuing the clean break report. You get the PNAC thing. It's, and they've wanted this. I mean, Netanyahu has been upset. The greater Israel idea, I guess, takes root largely after the 67 war more, more seriously. And 
Yeah. That's been everything they've tried to do. They say facts on the ground. It means they've been trying to do this for a long time. And this is just a final mm -hmm. solution. Mm -hmm. And I think that the problem is yeah. that it didn't go the way the neocons had hoped. They had their plan of regime change and you turn Iraq into maybe a client state or you partition it, which is what oh. Joe Biden wanted to do. Oh, Aaron. Uh, Aaron, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was sitting... I was sitting in a secure video teleconference at CIA headquarters the night before we invaded Iraq. Okay. I was the note taker in, in this, this principles committee meeting. So the meeting was chaired by Dick Cheney. Um, I was there as the note taker for, for George Tenet, who was the CIA director at the time. It included Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell. And I forget who the commander of CENTCOM was and, I mean, everybody who was anybody in Washington, including several senior directors at the National Security Council, were on this, this uh, video teleconference. And one, one idiot from the NSC, was one of the CIA director, or sorry, one of the uh, senior directors for the Middle East, said, and I'll never forget it, he said, when we cross that border tomorrow, they're going to throw flowers at us. They're going to throw flowers at us. And when I went back to my office... I said to the deputy director, who was my boss, I said, have none of these people studied the Middle East? Do none of them have any background in history to think that will be seen as anything but an occupation force? That, that the Iraqis will throw flowers at us? And another thing, when, when the meeting, and I've told this, this story a number of times, but when the meeting began, um, Cheney asked uh, Sink Sen, the, the commander of CENTCOM, to uh, start the briefing. And to tell you the truth, I, I don't like military briefings because I don't really understand them. Elements of the first corps are moving here and the third army division is moving there and the platoon is moving this way. And I, that means nothing to me. But then at the end of the briefing, he says, if all goes as planned, we can be in Tehran by August. And George very discreetly turned his microphone off and he turned to me and he said, did he say Tehran or did he say Baghdad? And I said, uh, he said Tehran. And George says, have these people lost their minds? And then he discreetly turned the microphone back on. So at the end of the meeting, I went back to my office and the, the deputy director said, how'd the meeting go? And I said, did you know we were going to attack Iran in, in August? And he said, oh. Are they still talking about that? He said, we're not going to attack Iran in August. These guys don't know anything about the Middle East. Thus, the, the flowers comment. But here we are, a generation later. What I'm talking about, this meeting that I'm talking about happened 22 years ago. And we still haven't learned anything. Right. I mean, they, 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 and they just aren't in the position they thought they would be in by now. I mean, they were supposed to go and put in a client and turn Iraq into a client state. Syria yeah. was supposed to go down. They failed oh, yeah. there. It was dominoes. Uh, remember it was yeah. going to be dominoes. And they, and, and now I, I feel that this is exacerbated by the recognition because the Wolfowitz and the neocons, they're very pro-Zionist, obviously. I think that's really the driving force now. I used to mm -hmm. think it's like, well, it's some sort of alliance. of, a, And I still think it is an alliance of crazy right-wing, you know, militarists and oil men oh, like oh, Cheney that, and so yeah, on. Yeah, that's a part of it. That's a part of yeah, it. Yeah, it's yes. a part of it. But the I think the driving force is has been Zionism and a hardline neocon Zionism. And they Backed they by the evangelicals. Yes, with but but in a socially engineered kind of way, I think that oh yeah, they, they put money into mega churches and other things like that to make to stupefy these people because there's no organic reason that people would believe something so insane and stupid. Even though there's a tradition of religious fundamentalism in the U.S. and so on, this is so unique and politically useful that it cannot be a natural phenomenon. It has to have been created by lots of money. I am a little bit embarrassed to tell you that I taught as an adjunct um, at Liberty University for four years. Liberty University, of course, is the world's oh, well, right. biggest, yeah, world's biggest uh, evangelical university. And the reason they hired me was because of my position on torture. And they said that torture was not Christian. So awesome. I taught uh, in, the, in the Jesse Helms School of Government. Okay. So we disagreed on 99.9% .9 of issues. 
but that one tenth of one percent that we agreed on was was torture. But one of the things that I learned is that American conservative American evangelicals have this inexplicably simplistic view of Israel, whereby number one, they don't have the foggiest idea that some Palestinians are Christians. Number one, like not the foggiest idea. Number two, they believe, like actually believe in their hearts that they can hasten the second coming of Christ, that it's within their power to hasten the second coming of Christ by forcing all of the world's Jews back to Israel. And so the Israelis are smart enough to know that they can exploit this stupidity on the part of American evangelicals by saying, hey, listen, you know, if you support Israel, we can give you money for your mega churches and you can encourage Jews to come home. And now they're joined at the hip, but for wildly different reasons. And it's just, it's just like you have to be half brain dead to not see what the Israelis, that the Israelis are playing you. But even if they realized it, I don't think they would care. Yeah. I mean, they, they wouldn't because they would see that it as the, even if they understood that they were being manipulated, they would think that the Israelis were doing it for, they may be doing it for wrong reasons, all, all, but they're going yeah. to rebuild that temple mount and they're going to slaughter those that cows. That is exactly right. This, all the crazy. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, we were just talking about slaughtering the cows today. Exactly. They're going to take the temple mount and they're going to put the third temple up and then we'll see. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, this is really lunacy. And I, I'll say this, the voice of reason here is, in a sense, Iran, uh, this, this is a picture of the aftermath of that attack of the, on the consulate in, uh, in Syria, the Iranian wow. consulate, and the killing of a very senior IRGC commander. And this, the analysis here, this is from the cradle, but um, the uh, political, analyst, Amal, Al, political analyst Amal Saad says, and this is so obvious, this, this killing appears less about employing the madman theory to intimidate and deter its adversaries and more about deliberately embracing a strategy of chaotic warfare to escalate and expand the scope of the conflict so the U.S. will be forced to directly enter the war. Yes. It should scare the hell out of all of us. We were just yes, talking about this. And I'll elaborate on this a little more because this came in the Jerusalem Post today. Um, Israel or Iran offers no response to Damascus strike if U.S. secures Gaza ceasefire. So apparently... Iran is behind the scenes saying we will not respond to that airstrike if you can or uh, you know negotiate a ceasefire Amazing. in Gaza which is to my mind quite magnanimous and that's some statesmanship from Iran which we don't see anything from the US except for yes. you know lying in a clown show every time any spokesperson opens their mouth but here they are what do you think uh, what do you think are the chances that Hezbollah and Iran working together could it could somehow find a way to defuse this without it going into a wider war because oh. i think that's in everybody's interest oh yeah, it it's is in the israelis interest if it they is in the crazy. israelis interest that's right and you know the, both iran and hezbollah have to be have to be lauded for their for their restraint from the very beginning of this it's incredible to me that we haven't seen almost the immediate expansion of the conflict and we haven't and it's because the iranians and hezbollah have been so um, so unwilling to take the Israeli bait and to respond to Israel's provocation or provocative uh, uh, actions. Um, now, the Iranians told us through the Swiss uh, uh, interest section, the U.S. interest section at the Swiss embassy in Tehran, they told us late last week that they intended to respond to the Israeli attack, but... They saw this as a state-to-state -state attack that required a state-to-state -state response. They would not use Shia militias in Iraq or Syria or Yemen to strike back at Israel. This would be a state response, number one. Number two, they said that they had no intention of hitting a U.S. target, that this was between Iran and Israel, and they wanted to tell us in advance. Now, can you remember a previous time when the Iranian government would proactively offer up assurances like this to the American government? Because I can't. So I think that the Iranians 
I think that the Iranians should be applauded for the way they've handled this thing. Now, the Israelis deserve to be smacked for what they did in in Damascus. And whatever the Iranians end up doing in retaliation, the Israelis have earned it. Oh, but well. I, think it's, I mean, the, the chances of Israel getting what it deserves are so small anyway. Oh, but whatever uh, Iran yeah. does will be oh, a part yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, I think that I think you're exactly correct that the ultimate Israeli goal is to drag the United States into this, no matter how bad it gets. I don't think they really care how far down the road it goes, including with the employment of nuclear weapons. I think that the goal, the ultimate goal is is to bring the U.S. in. Yeah. And China, China and Russia have made statements to the effect that they will, if it comes down to it, protect the sovereignty and the existence of the Iranian state. So yes, this would be bringing in, this would be essentially a nuclear doomsday if that comes down to that. If, if yes. And this is again, so not so difficult to game out. And yet there doesn't seem to be that ability anymore. And that's what is frightening about this. It's bad enough when you had all these cold war game war or game theory, machine mind people who were kind of lunatics but at least you felt like they could at least predict sometimes that if you did X and Y, then Z might happen, you know, yes. with some accuracy. They don't gain, yes. they've lost that ability. And that's what is frightening to me because the part of the reason I was skeptical that the Ukraine war would ever break out is because I didn't see it at all as being in the U.S. interest for something like that to happen. Agreed. It didn't make any sense to me at all. If I'd been reading Consortium News more, which I normally did at the time, I would have said, oh, yeah, it is, it, this is a good chance this is going to happen. I didn't say, like, oh, it'll never happen. But mm -hmm. I thought, like, I don't think that they will invade because I think that it doesn't make any sense for the U.S. to provoke an invasion because how could you possibly beat uh, Russia with Ukraine? Russia. And if you intervene right. more, then you have a nuclear war. And that's what I thought at the time. And I was that's obviously the case. Like, that's yeah. been the case. And yeah. why, so what the what what are we doing there? And why is Israel doing this when it's similarly like if they murder everyone uh, in Gaza, they will destroy themselves because the yeah. whole world will be aghast. If they start a war with Iran, it could lead to nuclear war. That's a disaster. There's no good solution to this. So why the hell are they doing the things that they're doing? Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I, I don't want to get too far off, uh, off of uh, Israel and Palestine, but you raise a good point about about Ukraine. And, you know, it makes you wonder what in the world Emmanuel Macron's uh, thinking when he says he wants to send uh, French combat troops to, uh, to Ukraine. That would be an act of war. And it would, it would draw NATO, including the United States, uh, directly into that war, just like the Israelis want to draw the United States into their war. None of it makes any sense. None of it. And you're right. What in the world would make the United States think? that Ukraine could beat Russia, a nuclear power, and one of the three most powerful countries in the world. And to what end? Why do we need Ukraine to be in NATO? We don't. No, we don't. I mean, Besides I... the fact that we repeatedly promised the Russians over the course of, what, three or four different presidential administrations that we would not expand NATO to Russia's border, and we did it multiple times multiple times and they finally had to put their foot down yeah this is this gets into what i the, the parallels i see there and it's been a bit shocking to me i'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that we've done because it involves the cia uh, that we've been working on at the podcast and we have a series coming up with uh my friend ben howard who has co-authored things with me and peter del scott uh in the past and uh, we're looking at Peter Dale Scott's 2005 article on the Global Drug Meta Group, and it deals with this military contractor outfit called Far West, which was something of a successor to BCCI, mm. and it involved all of these characters um, that that were in, that included people who planned the Russian 9/11 of 2000, which started off the Second Chechen War, and it it really gets into this whole post Cold War era that I I think people do not well understand and that I'm only trying to sort of look at some of this work and obscure work and make sense of what happened. But I now think that what, and I think your story actually fits into this and I'll try to explain how uh, I think that the big conflict in the, in George HW Bush's administration, because I used to hear uh, um, Lawrence Wilkerson and Ray McGovern say mm -hmm. that 
H.W. Bush always called the neocons the crazies, right? And said, yeah, like, did. oh, they're, they're dreaming up crazy shit in the basement. That's and then true. you had the the Wolfowitz insano version of the defense plan, which was basically like the PNAC manifesto, except it was like eight years before PNAC, where he was just right. saying that the Wolfowitz doctrine, we've got to make sure that no power could possibly challenge American uh, global dominance. And then even, this was too crazy for Bush. Bush is a guy and a, and a family that people on the left who are, study these you know imperial chicanery and covert operations and all this we think bush is pretty sinister but yes. i i think actually and i and i don't dispute that he is and that he's part of that american waspy establishment that did yeah. a lot of terrible things <laughs> but this neocon group is different and they are worse yeah, and they worse. were ch they were chastened when not only did bush leak that to the press and put the kibosh on wolfowitz's crazy plan for world domination but they also bush also hw bush also told the israelis that they need to negotiate a two-state solution seriously or they're not going to get these loan guarantees and no president had done that it got written up in israel that like this maybe is maybe why he lost and bush shouldn't have uh, you know betrayed his israel israeli friends so i think that there was a conflict that involved the upper echelons of the U.S. at this time, and that some of these investigations that came out like BCCI or the Danny Cosolaro, whoever it was that was feeding him information and it tied into some of these people, I think that there was a struggle between that old waspy mobbed up American establishment that George Bush and Alan Dulles and other people represent, and then the neocons, which are American hardline right-wingers, militarists, you know, people like Cheney or historically people like Scoop Jackson and so on. Yes. Uh, yes. And then, but merged with the Israel lobby and that this was really uh, the big conflict. And I think yeah. some of it involved covert operations in a sense and who would control them. I think that the U.S. back at, at different times was more in, involved with the kind of mafia type operations. And that when these scandals happen, just as they did in the 70s, they kind of get offshored in different ways. And I think that you look at Epstein and you think, what does Epstein represent? He's intelligence, but he's also got all these Israel connections. I think Israel has been running a lot of these crazy operations or the neocons have. And I'd, it would be really interesting to know to what extent these are handled by CIA, uh, the, the CIA and the American side. Or was there some sort of high level decision to outsource these to a kind of intelligence slash mob mafia sort of thing i mean it, it it actually makes me wonder go back and look at what were the zionist and israeli connections to like the lansky syndicate and so on over years and i don't think that we've ever we've never really fully investigated the relationship between the mob and the intelligence agencies and what the hell they were doing in the 90s who was approving it who was running it was it the u.s and the pentagon and the cia or was it a neocon sort of international with you know perhaps with guidance from Mossad and so on uh, it's uh, you look at these events and they are hard to explain except but with reference to a, a conflict sort of like Watergate yeah, and then, right. like I think that H.W. Bush was were removed by similar forces that removed Nixon because Nixon seems to have been I mean who was it that's there at the aftermath of Nixon's resignation under the Ford administration, it's Cheney yeah. and Rumsfeld, and they fire all the regular right-wingers, and they bring in neocon-type mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So this is like a, a part of our history that is important, and nobody really has written the definitive or even a definitive yeah, that's, strong version of it. That's your next book. You know, I'll tell you, um, Arabs say all the time, uh, well, Ar Arab diplomats, Arab intellectuals, political figures will tell you all the time that there have only been two presidents in American history that gave the Arabs a fair shake. And that was Dwight Eisenhower and George H.W. Bush. And that was it. That was it. In all of American history, they say that those are the two, the two presidents that they could trust. Not that they could trust the people that surrounded those presidents. J they should add JFK to that, though. He, Nasser, he, he should. Nasser yeah. wept and, uh, and was despondent for days when Kennedy when was Kennedy killed. Was and killed. Kennedy was trying to stop them from getting nuclear weapons. And he was trying to solve the Palestinian question. And a total yeah. 180 after the fact. It's true. Uh, it's true. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but you're right. The you know the the Wolfowitz, Cheney, Rumsfeld, uh, my God, Pearl. All, uh, Pearl. You know, there's there's a famous story that that on September 11th, um, 
Richard Pearl was at the White House and he said, uh, you know, we have to attack Iraq. And uh, several, several of the NSC people said, we don't think Iraq did this. And he said, I don't care who did it. We have to attack Iraq. And that was the policy. I mean, you Sam know? Huntington wrote in, I think it's in Clash of the Civilizations. He says, Iraq is the only country that could challenge like Western hegemony in the Middle East. Uh, because Iraq has a uh, agricultural capacity with those mm -hmm. famous riverbanks and that's deltas, right. and uh, they have some industry and some social services and so on. And so I, I think that's what really those sanctions were about in the nineties where they were just, let's keep Iraqi oil off the market. Let's not let that country develop. Let's just make it a basket case because it's, be we're better off that way. Uh, and and that was the policy. That. that was the policy during the Iran Iraq war too, where you support both sides you give intelligence, especially overhead imagery to both sides. You provide weapons to both sides because you want that war to go on forever. So they completely destroy each other. And then you don't have to do it. That's I'll what give Casey you another said. example. But yeah. Casey used to make a joke. He used to say, oh, yeah, we're funding both sides so they'll kill each other. Yeah. Um, in, in 2008 and again in 2011, I went to Afghanistan to study the heroin poppy crop. I was the chief investigator on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at the time. And so um, I went with, uh, with a guy from DEA and with a, a couple of military guys, and we went to Kandahar and to Helmand province, Lashkar Ga, where they grow most of the heroin poppy. And the bottom line was this, Afghanistan produces 93% of the world's heroin. Almost all of that heroin goes to Iran and Russia. And so when I said, wow, you know, why don't we do something to stop, you know, encourage them to, to grow things with two growing seasons, I said, grow onions and tomatoes and pomegranates. Um, we, we could provide the seeds. We could provide the, the fertilizer. We don't want them to grow vegetables. We want Iranians and Russians to be hooked on heroin. And the truth is that Iran has the highest rate of opioid addiction in the world, and Russia has the second highest rate in the world, just the way we want it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really wild what the U.S. has done with drugs. I mean, when they, there was a little bit of a pushback with Nixon's war on drugs, yeah. uh, and he shut down the, the Air America, you know, drug connection, uh, Yes. Basically, it got exposed by Peter, Peter Dell Scott, really. Alfred McCoy's famous Amazing. for it, but it was really Peter. Mm -hmm. It was Al, Al McCoy's story is that um, it was the poet Allen Ginsberg that that turned him on to this. But Allen Ginsberg actually wrote to Peter a letter and said, hey, I heard you've been talking about this. Could you send me material on the uh, on the dope trade in the CIA? And he and Peter did. And then he uh, Peter and then Ginsberg talks to McCoy. I think McCoy may have been writing something of a limited hangout in a sense but uh, that's right. a whole other story they suppressed peter's book which was the better one and the more incisive one uh, i think the war conspiracy it yeah. gets uh, they they hold it off for two years they don't publish it and it turns out that the publishing house in the middle of indiana which published some anti-war people for strange reasons and the one that held peter's book so that al mccoy's book would come out first uh -huh. that place with that publishing house was called bob's merrill and the legal counsel for it was William Harvey of the CIA, one of the most notorious, you know, murderous <laughs> individuals ever. So it, it's really wild. But Peter has wrote in 2003, before he wrote this book about Far West and the Global Drug Meta Group, he wrote Drugs, Oil and War. And he noticed that, you know, pipelines and weapons and uh, drugs, they, they keep they overlap in U.S. foreign policy over and over again. This picture here in the graphic is Camp Bond Steel which was built in 19, uh, you know, after the Kosovo war. Mm -hmm. And I want to give you a little bit of a timeline here and see what you, you think of this in the context of the neocon, uh, you know, takeover of U.S. foreign policy. So a lot of this has to, there were pipeline routes and so on. This is Peter's, you know, drugs, oil and war thesis. You had in 1991, this gets into what I'd call the neocon international. And it's, it's relevant to Ukraine. It's relevant to all this. In 1991, there was a coup. Uh, there was a, a strange entity set up in Azerbaijan called Mega Oil. It was, it was oil companies and people like Richard Secord and Ed Dearborn from Iran Contra, oh, yeah. you know, ex CIA yeah. guys. Yep. And they set up an airline uh, just like it, like the uh, Air America, more or less. And they started flying in jihadis 
and uh, Chechen groups and Albanian groups became involved in the heroin traffic. They were facilitating these things. And eventually they stage a coup in Azerbaijan and they pull it out of the Russian orbit and into the U.S. orbit. There's a Azerbaijan Chamber of Commerce with people like Dick Cheney and Richard Armitage on it. And it just becomes like a, you know, a sort of principality of uh, the neocon international, basically. And they want these pipelines uh, that are, there's these pipelines planned to get Azerbaijan gas to the Black Sea or through Turkey. And you can see this ad. BP just launched a big Azerbaijan gas pipeline. They, they call it the Shah Deniz II gas field after the British puppet, you know, that the CIA reinstalled. <laughs> so it's really, it, it's, it's ridiculous. But we see that part. And, you know, it leads to the Chechen war, which you see that like Putin has said a couple of times now, hey, you guys were backing these uh, jihadis. Why were you doing that when you're yeah. supposed to be fighting this war on terror? A uh, good question. Yep. And then uh, additionally, on the, the, the further side, on the other side of the Black Sea, you have a, a plan for this AMBO pipeline, which never really comes through, but there's still other versions of it that they're trying to get, get through. But it was uh, AMBO because it's Albania, Macedonia, and Bulgaria oil pipeline, right? That's the AMBO. And this was a this was at the same time, and in a part of uh, the coast of the operations in Yugoslavia, you have Camp Bonsteel set up, and that becomes a big hub for heroin, right? So you have these Terrible. U.S. operations with jihadis in Azerbaijan, in Chechnya, and they're all doing things to facilitate what the U.S. wants. In Kosovo, the KLA is there, a terrorist organization, mafia, and their partner on the ground is Al Qaeda led by Muhammad al zawahri no less, yeah. in, in oh 1998, 1999. And I put a little X here on the graphic to show where Camp Bonsteel is, but it's basically not just guarding these, uh, it, it sort of presides over these uh, oil pipeline routes that are very strategic, uh, but also it, heroin went in and out of there and all sorts of other illicit traffics with uh, the, the, Albain, the Kosovar mafia, basically. And it was like they, this was this whole neocon foreign policy and these entities like Far West, were military contractors working with Chechen uh, warlords and drug dealers and people that were in Russian, you know, a fit Russian officials, but people that were not Putin, Putin loyalists, people that were more loyal to Yeltsin and Berezhowski, basically Western stooges. And uh, this all seems to be part of this neocon international and when you now we're seeing like these same sort of entities like tajikistan people attacking uh moscow and then trying yeah. to flee to ukraine yeah uh it, it, it's like they they it really is this kind of it, this sort of fascist force in the u.s it's like a it's i i just call it the parafascist neocon international because it's like it's a way that you can have the essentially like a global fuhrer principle where you just break whatever laws you want all the time except you just say we didn't do that <laughs> like we have all these policies that we're just like oh no we don't we didn't do that but the, they are using these jihadis and then you turn around to 9 11 and then all of a sudden it becomes the reason for like actually going over there and putting more military bases in all these same places because the same groups they've been you know supporting supposedly are attacking us but then our only remedy is to go and do all these things we wanted to do in the energy heartlands of the world anyway i mean it, it's it's a scandal. It, it, it needs to be investigated. And yet we're, we can't do anything about it. We're yeah. just like, uh, we see what they want with the NATO expansion. We see what the neocons want with these, the, what the Zionists want, who are the main really force behind the neocons. We see how insane they are with Gaza. And it, it, I feel like the 21st century and even the nineties, the post cold war era was a, was sort of a, a kind of mobbed up, uh, foreign policy adventure to try to take over the whole world and it just failed it, uh, it, and now we're seeing that it fall apart mm -hmm. it's run aground on israel i mean iraq and afghanistan first but israel syria uh you know gaza i mean uh, ukraine it's all fa falling apart and i don't see how they can salvage it so what 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 do we do with these this history that's a fake history and fake news day to day and it doesn't matter because no matter how much they lie about it we're still at this point where everything's falling apart anyway yeah, what can we do? I mean, in a perfect world, we could rely on the congressional oversight committees to ensure that this kind of thing doesn't happen. But that that doesn't work. It's never it's never worked. At least, besides um, 
working very briefly in 1975 and 76, uh, it's just not worked. Uh, so and I question how much that worked. I question yeah. how much that worked at all, because I now think more that some of the function of that was to take covert operations and move, make them even further removed. I actually yeah. think that some of the people that were behind the, the, the Freedom of Information Act may have been working along similar lines. Like if you make it so the U.S. is not able to carry out covert operations because there's a little bit of a fear of Congress or whatever, mm. then, the, then the, the response of the people running the U.S. is not like, well, we're going to have to be lawful. It's that they're going to have to outsource some of these things. Yeah, I think you drive it deeper underground. And I, and I think that Israel has been a major repository and driver of of the uh, of this that they've that they've taken over a lot of the things that the CIA might have wanted to do in the past i think that some of these investigations had a weird side to them of like really trying to 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 make it so the us can't carry out covert operations so it has to rely on these other these other outfits and that gives them power otherwise it's hard to it's hard to totally understand how israel can bend the us to its will I don't think they totally control it because I think the U.S. is going to push back because this is so disastrous. But, man, it, it's it's definitely not like a, a, a normal relationship between countries. Yeah. And I think that the clandestine part of it is a, is a, is important. And yet it's never really been told because, of course, it's all secret. Yes. Yeah. And it'll always be secret. You know, it's one of the what, what it is called the holy of holies in the uh in the intelligence committee, you can't ever talk about sources and methods. You can't ever talk about liaison relationships and you can't talk about anything having to do with NSA, but sources and methods is it, it completely encompasses uh, covert action. They don't even like saying the words covert action, right? You can't even really speak the words covert action when you're, when you're inside the CIA, that's how secretive it is. So yeah, I think you're right. I think that we've we've put ourselves in a position where we probably are outsourcing a lot of these covert action programs. There is no oversight, and even if there was oversight, I think that that the um, oversight committee members in both the House and the Senate have either been so co-opted that they just buy in, or they've been so cowed that they don't object. So, what do the people that you are in contact? I, I don't know how many people at the agency are still in contact with, but. I, I, no, they're supposed to be dispassionate realists supposed to be. are there do you hear any realists who are like able to look at the united states position and how it has deteriorated so much and how our possibilities are are going to have to be narrowed a good bit and our ambitions scaled back are is is that even setting into or is there such a group think and a kind of enforced conformity that nobody really says like yeah. This whole thing has been a, a quest for empire and it's failed. Oh, and yeah, we've yeah. got to deal with it. Is anybody saying that? No, uh, they're not. Groupthink is a big problem, but you'll get former CIA officers to say that until the cows come home. But people who are still active in the CIA, no, they, they would never be so self-reflective. Absolutely not. That's why that's why people like like Ray McGovern, for example, or Fulton Armstrong are such gems. Because they they speak freely, then they were senior officers. They were senior intelligence service officers, um, so they they know of what they speak. But among people who were still actively CIA, absolutely not. Right. It's just it's this alarming sense that there's nobody who's sensible looking at these these things. I yeah. just it, it's. Uh, and acad academics are, are bad. Even leftist anti-imperialists are often very blinkered. Strangely, some one of the best people out there is Jeff Sachs. I mean, he he actually sounds like he is summarizing my own like dissertation <laughs> in his broad uh, uh, arguments. It's actually remarkable. I mean, I wrote in 2015 that the U.S. is basically a lawless, top-down uh, state that is bent on world domination and has institutionalized the uh, abrogation of the rule of law and uh, through covert operations and everything else. And so on, he now says similar things and he says similar things about JFK. He even talks about the, you know, the jihadi operations in the nineties and such. And uh, it's, it's so jarring to listen to him compared to all the other academics. It's just, they've really created a totalitarian system where whether you're in academia or anywhere else, you, every incentive 
if you want to advance is to uh, accept really the big lie over and over again, different big lies uh, in general. And it's, mm-hmm. I don't know how we overcome this except without with some sort of defeat. But when we are t- a nuclear armed nation, that's a dicey proposition. Yeah, you can say that again. Look at the risk of miscalculation. It's almost not worth taking. And, and I don't, <laughs> you just, it's, you, there seem to be no adults in the in the room uh the the biden biden and trump both are are insane uh and they don't hire anyone who's able to say anything the best guy is john kirby only because he looks so uncomfortable he looks like a sitcom character with that smirk on his face all the time like it's slapstick but like there's nobody (laughs) that's sensible and speaking truth about these things at all yeah sad but true so I, I, but I think that things that can't go on forever don't, and so that is something to make note of. But what does that mean? It just is like that saying, like things can't. If things are gonna stay the same, they're gonna have to change a lot. You know, there's like that yeah, sort of joke, right? <laughs> so, but and I can accept that. But what does that mean? It's almost like Yogi Berra is uh, is telling us what we I need know. to what we need to focus on. <laughs> That's what we need as president. He's dead, but maybe with yeah. AI we can somehow resurrect him, and that That's we right. can just make him our president. <laughs> well, John, uh, I want to thank you very much for um, for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, where can people follow your work? I know you're on Sputnik. Anything else you want to talk about here? Oh yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I'm on Sputnik. I've got a weekly TV show uh, that's uh, syndicated in 33 countries. But the easiest way to uh, to find any of it is on Substack at John Kiriaku. Thanks okay. for having Excellent. me. Excellent. I will put links in the show notes. And uh, as ever, I appreciate you uh, spending time with us. Thanks so much, Aaron. It's a pleasure. Thanks to Dana Trevaria for producing this episode, and thank you for tuning in. You can buy or rent the Four Die Trying Prologue now on Amazon and other streaming platforms. Chapter 1 is also available now. Visit fourdietrying.com for details. Please do subscribe to the American Exception podcast on Patreon for first access to all Devil's Chess Club episodes and for all new and past episodes of the American Exception podcast, including new episodes of our Peter Dale Scott Oral history series and this series on Far West, which we discussed during the show. One thing I meant to mention before getting a little sidetracked Uh, It's about John and his CIA torture whistleblowing ordeal. I mentioned this in the past, but I wanted to mention it again. It's related to my thesis that the end of the Cold War began a new deep state conflict in the U.S. The waspy U.S. establishment of people like the Rockefellers, Dean Acheson, Alan Dulles, Brzezinski, George H.W. Bush, basically the U.S. establishment's imperial realists, versus what we can call the neoconservatives, or the neocon parafascist international. I believe that what happened during this time period, around 05, 06, was that pressure from the neocons was building to go into Iran, to go further than they had before. They wanted to start a whole bunch of different wars. They eventually would get their way with wars in uh, Syria and Libya, but for at the time, they really wanted to go into Iran, which John was talking about earlier. I think that was the context in which John Superior uh, set things in motion for John to be put in this place where he ends up blowing the whistle on torture, despite not really setting out to do that at the outset. He ended up going to jail for this and was the only person prosecuted uh, for the torture regime created by Dick Cheney and George W. Bush, which is really something. That's a perfect American thing. The only people that get punished for Uh, major crimes are those who expose them because it's essentially a criminal regime. So I think in some, John Superior may have essentially sacrificed John as part of an establishment campaign to undercut the neocon W. Bush administration before they could go into Iran or before they could stage a terror spectacle to blame on Iran. John Kiriakou, for the bigger cause, may have had to go to prison, but the war with Iran was avoided. Rumsfeld was soon replaced as Secretary of Defense, and the neocons had their wings clipped for a moment. In other words, John was treated like a pawn on the devil's chessboard.